Hi, um, my name is Melanie McNair. I'm the Senior Director of Public Programming at the Center for Fiction, and it's my absolute delight to welcome you all here this evening. How many of you are visiting us for the first time? Oh, wow, so many of you. Uh, well, welcome. Um, if you don't know much about us, the Center for Fiction is the only literary nonprofit that focuses on the creation and enjoyment of fiction, and we like to celebrate storytelling in all forms. Uh, in addition to the events that we do here um, in the bookstore, in the cafe we have, we do a number of uh, other things, including an emerging writing fellowship and a kids read program in Title I schools in New York City. So whenever you come here and buy tickets to an event or buy a book or buy coffee, you're helping to support young readers and young writers. And so we appreciate that and thank you. Uh, we're also a membership library. You can see some of the library books here. Um, there's a member floor upstairs. I encourage you to learn about membership. There's some brochures outside in the bookstore um, and join us as members. A few housekeeping items before I introduce our guest. Please keep your masks on unless you're actively eating or drinking. Uh, there is a restroom on this floor. It's just against this back wall. And uh, for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, uh, I apologize to you. Our Zoom um, tech is not working very well. So we're doing a workaround with a laptop in front of the stage. Um, and uh, hi, there you are. <laughs> um, I do want to reassure you, though, that we have uh, a, a, an excellent recording that is being made, and we will share that with you. Um, so apologies there. Um, we will have an audience Q&A as part of this event. And for you Zoom folks, um, we'll be able to uh, include a question or two from you if you would just type those into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And uh, for those of you who are here in person, you'll need to come up and speak your questions into that microphone. That's so that the people who are joining us via Zoom can hear you and also so that it'll be in the recording. All right. Um, Andrea pre-signed all of her books, but if you would like for your book to be personalized, she'll be doing that after this event. Okay, now let's get on with it, shall we, to the main event. Um, we're very excited to begin the evening with a performance of the, from the book by Paula Christensen. Paula is thrilled to have narrated the forthcoming audiobook version of On a Night of a Thousand Stars. Uh, she was born into a prominent show business family in Buenos Aires, Ar Argentina, and raised in the suburbs of New York City. She has performed extensively on stage and in television in New York and Los Angeles, and we're very happy to welcome her here. Come on up. Excerpt, chapter one. It's summer 1998 in the Hamptons. Paloma Larrea, the daughter of Argentinians, is a college student who has grown up in New York City. She's at her parents' annual summer soiree when she meets a guest named Graciela. Hi, I'm Paloma, I said. Nice to meet you. Graciela. The smiling woman began to introduce herself, but stopped short as I approached. She looked at me quizzically through tortoiseshell glasses. Graciela de Graf, but everyone calls me Grace, she resumed. Such a pleasure. When Juan told me he was dating Santiago Larrea's daughter, I just had to see you with my own eyes. I knew your father in Buenos Aires, but we lost touch years ago when I moved to Holland. Have you seen him yet? Not yet, just from afar. He's been very busy tending to his many guests, Grace said with a laugh. Like the Santiago I remember, always surrounded by a million friends. She took a caipirinha from a passing waiter. These are lethal, but delicious. Let me bring you to him, I offered. I'm sure he'll be happy to see you. Taking Grace by the arm, I called out to my parents across the lawn. 
Dad squinted as we approached, but then returned to his conversation with an elderly couple. Your parents are just as good looking as they were 25 years ago, Grace remarked. You knew my mother too? Oh, yes. Everyone knew Santiago and Lila, Grace said. I was happy to learn they had a child. Really? You sound as if you were surprised. I don't know. I guess we didn't talk about having kids back then, she said wistfully. We were kids ourselves. Papa, Mama, look who I just met. My parents greeted Grace with blank expressions. Santiago, it's been a long time. Grace went to kiss him hello, but something in his eyes made her stop. Grace Diaz, Dad pronounced slowly. It's the Graf now. I've been married, divorced, and recently remarried. How's that for a good Catholic girl? Terrible, I know. She laughed. But I keep reminding myself that I made a much better decision the second time around. Anyway, you must meet Eric. Uh, he's here somewhere. She gestured vaguely out to the party. We'd love to meet him, Dad said. He turned to my mother. Can you believe it, Lila? After all these years? It's Grace. Incredible, Mom said. How have you been? This is an unexpected surprise, Dad added. What brings you here to the Hamptons? We are staying with the De Conins. My husband and Dirk are childhood friends. By my father's expression, I could tell he didn't register the name. You all knew each other in Buenos Aires? I chimed in. Uh, yes, that's right. Grace and I studied law together at the Universidad de Buenos Aires he said, becoming animated as he mentioned his alma mater. My God, that building was falling apart inside even then. And the hours we spent in the library, it turned out to be a monumental waste of time, at least for me. But we had fun, didn't we? <laughs> yes, we did, Grace said with a laugh. My goodness, it sure is good to see you again, he said kissing her lightly on the cheek. I think an encounter like this deserves a toast, Mom said. She lifted her empty champagne flute and signaled to the waiter. As the waiter refreshed our glasses, Grace's husband Eric ambled over. After Dad shared a couple of stories from their law school days that had everyone laughing, Grace turned to me and said, your father hasn't aged at all. Like many men my age, my hair is getting thinner and my waist is growing thicker, Dad said with his typical self-deprecating charm. You mean to say that you have a thin waist and thick hair, Grace laughed, calling him out on his false modesty. She spoke to him in a familiar tone, and it delighted me to see the affection between him and an old friend. He was remarkably fit and slender in middle age. His dark brown hair, brushed back with a hint of gel, had only recently started showing silver near his temples, enhancing his distinguished good looks. He was the most handsome man in our class, Grace said to the group. My father raised his hand to protest. No, no, Santiago, don't try to say otherwise. You were quite a catch. The problem is, you knew it. But I think our friend Maximo came in a close second. Wouldn't you agree, Lila? Aren't most 20-something-year-old men good-looking? <laughs> you know, when you're that young, Mom suggested casually, but her tone was slightly pitched. Dad and I knew well enough that this only happened when she was nervous. Mom gripped her champagne glass while smiling politely at their unexpected visitors. I see that life has been kind to you, Grace said to my father. It's true, I've been blessed. Dad put a protective arm around mom. Not so for some others we knew. Those were complicated times, Grace. Anyway, now is not the time for boring old stories. Boring, 
Grace turned to me. Paloma, I wonder how much you know about Argentina during those years. I glanced at my parents. Talk of Argentina's military dictatorship in the 1970s had been taboo in our family for as long as I could remember. Sadly, not much, I told Grace. Well, I think you should be aware that, thanks to your father, many people were spared. I said not now, Grace. My father's sharp tone startled her into silence. He opened his mouth to say something else, but then closed it again. Grace looked at him with a pained expression before turning on her heel and walking off. I didn't mean to upset her, Dad mumbled without quite looking at anyone. She has a good memory, but that was a really long time ago. He turned to Eric. I'm sorry if I was abrupt. Not at all. I should be the one to apologize for her. Eric said. Sometimes she likes to talk about the old days in Argentina, especially if she's had a drink or two. She's been an expat for years now, so I think she was excited to see an old friend from university. I'm sure you understand. Of course, no need to apologize, please. As soon as Eric left, Mom turned to Dad. She still has eyes for you, that's clear enough, <laughs> my mother said. She was long accustomed, if not resigned, to the effect her husband had on women. I hadn't given much thought to my father's life as a bachelor, but Grace's remarks made me wonder, what had be he been like as a young man? Grace is stuck in the past, Dad said. It happened to some people. They haven't been able to move on. I did. That's all. But. She said people's lives were spared because of you, I said. What did she mean by that? It was not often I was on the receiving end of one of my father's withering looks, a look he'd bestow on a housekeeper when a shirt had not been pressed properly or when the coffee was not prepared to his liking. But when he spoke next, his tone was gentle. Ancient history, sweetheart, he said. We move forward a bit to chapter two. It's now June 1973 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Santiago Larrea is a law student and he's late to meet a classmate to review notes for an upcoming exam. It's the same day that General Juan Domingo Perón, the former president of Argentina, who has been living in exile in Madrid for the past 18 years, is set to return to Argentina after his party, the Justicialist Party, has won the first democratically held elections in years. Santiago spotted his friend at a table in the back corner. Her chestnut bangs grazed her tortoiseshell glasses as she sat there reading. Although her given name was Graciela, the anglicized version, Grace, had been her nickname since childhood. He kissed her cheek and sat down. Grace stubbed out her cigarette and stood up. Don't get too comfortable. You're coming with me. Where? We are going to Ezeiza. The airport? Why? It's going to be a nightmare. A million people are expected to show up. Santi, Grace said, calling Santiago by his nickname. Come on, give me a ride. Let's embrace this historic occasion. But I'm not a peronista. I know, I know. You're strictly a la reaista, she cajoled him. Oh, I'm going back to bed, he said, picking up his backpack. No, you're not, she said, and nudged his back. We can tell our kids one day we were at the airport the day Perón came back from exile. After touching down in Ezeiza, Perón was planning to give a speech from a temporary stage that had been erected for the occasion in an open field 10 kilometers from the airport. It was a strange setup for a political address, but Perón wanted to speak directly to his followers as soon as he landed and didn't want anyone else dictating the logistics of his return. Santiago envisioned a chaotic drive to the outskirts of the capital, but he finally agreed. Fine, you owe me one, Grace, he said, as she nudged him toward the door. Don't worry, it'll be worth it, she teased him. I'll introduce you to that cute girl you've had your eyes on in our civil procedures class. 
They drove northwest out of the city, then looped back southwest onto the highway toward the airport. When they couldn't drive any farther, still a mile or so from the airport, they parked the car on one of the flat fields by the side of the road and joined the throngs of people. It felt to Santiago like a pilgrimage. The procession of two million people took on a festive tone. Students, couples, and entire families with their children were walking hand in hand, singing the Peronist anthem and taking photos of each other waving the peace sign. While living abroad, Juan Perón had taken on mythical proportions, even as his justicialist party had split into right and left wing factions. Many believed his return would bring back the good union jobs, affordable food, and other benefits that Perón was credited with bestowing on them in his, in his two terms in office. Others, including students who had come of age during his absence, thought it would bring about a social revolution. Santiago, however, wasn't one of those students. As he suspected, neither was Grace. But she was a curious, enthusiastic type, and she enjoyed being part of something bigger than herself. Bidon's chartered plane from Madrid had yet to land, but the crowd was already pressing forward to be as close as possible to the stage. Santiago and Grace stayed back. It was pointless to try to advance further. As the morning wore on, Santiago's impatience changed to irritation. Grace was talking to a woman carrying her baby in a sling. He was about to tell Grace he was leaving when his restless gaze drifted over the sea of humans undulating across the flat green fields on both sides of the highway. Suddenly, a few popping sounds drew his eyes back to the stage. Near the front, individuals were crumpling to the ground. Only then did he realize that the popping sounds were gunfire. Snipers had infiltrated the masses, and the shots seemed to be coming from all directions. He spotted men with rifles in the treetops. From the stage, men were shooting randomly into the crowd. Santiago found himself jostled from all sides. The odors from strangers' bodies assaulted his nostrils. He felt a crush, and then a stranger's breath in his face as he stumbled to the ground. Grace had fallen, too. Santiago who knew from shooting at his family's ranch how much harder it was to target a moving animal, yelled at Grace to run. They pushed and shoved to get away from the stage until the crowd thinned out and they were at a safe distance. Pausing to catch his breath, Santiago looked back at the scene they had just fled. Around the stage and beyond, piles of bodies remained flattened on the ground. What the hell is happening? Santiago shouted. It took barking orders from police megaphones to get Santiago and Grace, unable to tear their eyes away from the mayhem, to start running again and not stop until they reached his car. Their faces were streaked with dirt. Her pants had ripped at one knee. His sweater was soiled. Only when Santiago struggled to turn the key in the ignition did he notice how much his hands were trembling. So much, Paula. What a treat. Actors really do bring something special, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let me introduce our uh, guest this evening. Andrea Yayura Clark grew up in Argentina amid the political turmoil of the 1970s until her family relocated to North America. After completing her university studies, she returned to Buenos Aires to reconnect with her roots. By the mid-1990s, many sons and daughters of the disappeared, the youngest victims of Argentina's military dictatorship of the 1970s, were coming of age and grappling with the fates of their families. She interviewed several of these children and their experiences, not widely known outside of Argentina, inspired the novel On a Night of a Thousand Stars, which of course we're here to celebrate. And she's joined in conversation by Jennifer Egan. Jennifer is the author of six previous books of fiction, A Visit from the Goon Squad, which won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Books Critics Circle Award, The Keep, The Story Collection, the Emerald City, Look at Me, a National Book Award finalist, The Invisible Circus, and most recently, Manhattan Beach, which won the Carnegie Medal for Literary Excellence. 
You may also pre-order her book that's coming out soon, The Candy House. We welcome you to the stage. Hello, is it working? Um, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, Andrea, huge congratulations. It's thank your pub you. day of your first novel. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. And it is thrilling, I think we all feel that, to share this night with you. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you, you so for being much. with us. So, like so many Americans, um, my, my knowledge of history is sometimes a little foggy, and I thought maybe if you could just start by giving us just a basic historical context, and we've heard this and that, Dirty War, 1970s, mm -hmm. Peron, but it's sort of complicated. Um, so if you could just walk us through it in a basic way, that'll give us a, a structure as we move forward in our conversation. Okay, yes, in the simplest way possible, I'll, I'll start with, Peron and Evita. I think a lot of people might have heard of Evita because of the musical and the movie. So I'll s start with Peron being the president in the mid-1940s, and he was a populist president, beloved. His wife was beloved by the masses, the, dis the, the shirtless, descamisados in Spanish. And sadly, in 1952, she passed away. And in 1955, a rival faction of the armed forces overthrew him and sent him into exile for the next 18 years. There were a series of dictatorships, civilian governments, up until 1973. Um, but during his absence, he, you know, the, per the Peronista party was banned. You, it, you couldn't utter his name out loud. But he retained his followers. They grew in numbers. A lot of people came of age during his absence, and these were young students who loved him and wanted him to come back. And so through various efforts, some were violent, you know, they, some guerrilla organizations were formed. But through their e efforts, they were able to get the government in 19, the military government in 1972 to hold elections democratically held elections, and he was, re he, the Peronista party was able to be on the ticket, and the party won. So he came back in 1973, which is the, the scene that Paola read so beautifully, and he dies in 1974, and his wife takes over the, she can't, she can't rule properly. And this is obviously not Evita, this is. This, yeah, this is the second wife, sorry, right. Isabel Peron. And you know there's chaos in the in the country, and so the she gets overthrown as well um, by the military junta in 1976. So the dirty war is those years beginning with Perón's return and extending through the military dictatorship. Yes, and so what I I want to I should clarify is that his party they was divided already between the left and the right wings of the party, and they, the Peron, as soon as he landed, sort of made it clear that he was going to not go with what the leftist um, students wanted, and he allowed for the right-wing faction of the party to go after the leftist. So there was, there was, you And know, that starts right at the airport. Yes. That's what the shooting In is. In effect, yes. Okay. All right, so that's very helpful. Thank you. And so your, your story is unfolding in two time frames, and the, the first is the 1990s, and that was the chapter, that, the, part, the section that we heard initially, where Paloma, um, our kind of major protagonist, mm -hmm. is at a family party where it was wonderful to hear Paola read this because I felt like mm -hmm. there is simmering with tension that clearly is all about a kind of subtext that Paloma does not know and we the readers don't know. Um, but that clearly is, is unresolved, and that's, that seems extremely clear. Um, and so Paloma ends up going to Argentina shortly thereafter for a celebration for her father, and she has a kind of awakening. And I wonder if you could talk about what brings that on exactly. 
her, her encounter with this old friend of his from the university was one that she had never really met anybody from his past. And when she asked him about what her, what his friend had said, it's about when she asked her father, you yes, mean. when she asked her father what her, Graciela meant by saying you, you spared people's lives, um, and he brushed her off, she, she realized that her father was not going to be very forthcoming, so she, when they go to Argentina, she decides to do a little investigation of her own. And in doing so, she, and through a chance encounter, she meets some people who talk about that time um, in the 70s, and she grew up not talking about it. It was, it was taboo. And so what unfolds is, is, is a book that's really structured like a mystery. I mean, it's a page turner, and I'm, we're not giving anything away here, so we're going to talk <laughs> around it. No spoilers. <laughs> Um, but Paloma is essentially a detective, and it's really her job in the course of the book to try to reconcile these two time frames that we are following. We know they're connected, but we don't exactly know how. And I wondered if you could talk about how you end, so it has a kind of genre feel to it in the best way. Oh, thank um, you. What made you approach this as a kind of detective story or a mystery? So when I, I was living in Argentina and had met these, um, these people who had been the children of the disappeared. And hearing those stories, and they stayed with me and when, when I moved back to the United States, I, I knew that people wouldn't know about them. And I wanted to somehow bring it to readers. And so my way of doing that was by having Paloma be a young woman growing up in New York, daughter of Argentines. And so when she returns to Argentina for her father's appointment, and not knowing much at all, the reader gets to accompany her on this journey. So that's how I saw it. It was like that as she's un uncovering the history of the country, the reader also would. So it, it, it sort of happened like that, naturally. I wasn't thinking, you know, genre specific, but... And so when you talk about the disappeared, I think we kind of generally know what that means, but this actually is a kind of historic historical term, really, with regard to the yes. Dirty War. What exactly does that mean, the disappeared? So what was happening, and it, and it started in 1973 with Perón, he allowed for the creation of a, you know, a secret um, organization called the Anti-Communist Argentine Alliance, the AAA. Um, they specifically targeted people they, that they considered um, dangerous to the government or left-leaning intellectuals, artists, and they were picked up from their offices, off the street, and they literally they would be disappeared. When family members would go to police stations, they were, you know, turned away or said, like, we don't know anything about your spouse. Um, you know, so that's what they were start they started to be called. What happened in 1976, once Isabelita Perón's government was overthrown, was that the military junta, they perfected that system of disappearing people. And again, denying, you know, when family members would show up at the Ministry of the Interior or Social Welfare just to get some answers. They would just say, no, they must have run off or, you know, just zero accountability. And was this something you knew about? So you, you were in Argentina as a child. Mm -hmm. Let's go to your history now for okay. a minute, because in a way, your history really connects with this in the sense that your own investigations as a young woman at around Paloma's mm -hmm. age mm -hmm. in some ways led to the material that you're drawing on here. So you were a child in Argentina. Yes. And talk about your family left at a certain point. Talk about when that was and why. Yeah, so we were a we're big family. Of four siblings, and we were living in the suburbs of Buenos Aires. My father was a psychiatrist and a writer. Uh, he had published poetry and some short stories. As a psychiatrist, he was approached by the security forces during Perón's time to help them with the interrogation of political prisoners. He didn't he turned them down. He didn't specifically ask what it would entail, but he assumed that it would not be good. And in fact, um, they did have doctors present when um, prisoners were being tortured to make sure that they hadn't died. Um, and as a writer, he, his editor was disappeared. So 
we had that concern. And then in our daily lives, my mother, we, we, we talked about this as I was, when I was writing the book, she reminded me how there would be bomb threats at our school, so we wouldn't go to school, or if there was a brown, like a crushed brown paper bag on the street, that we shouldn't kick it because it might be a bomb. Again, because there was some guerrilla activity happening in the city, you know? Um, so at some, one point, my parents decided it was time for us to leave, and we were lucky. We were fortunate that we were able to do that. And what year was that? That was just a few months before the dictatorship. Okay, so after the time that you're described that we just heard about in yes, chapter yes. two. Okay, and, and so as you were growing up, I mean it's sort of funny to hear people twenty years after the history of the dirty war, um, to hear Santiago, Paloma's father, say, you know, that someone who's still thinking about this is stuck in the past and mm -hmm. that it's ancient history. It's not that long ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about whether this felt like ancient history to you growing up. Did you even know about any of this or talk about it with your family and your father? No, my, my father was very quiet about it. He didn't talk about it. And we as his children didn't ask him about it, and I'm not sure why. Um, nobody did. I went back as a student, as a that study abroad year that one can do in college, and I really reconnected then. Um, with the country, and it was really just a few years after the dictatorship fell. And even then, people weren't talking about it. Certainly, not in my, none of my relatives were. And when I moved back in the early 90s, because I had decided at that point that I wanted to live there again, that really felt like home to me, um, they, people weren't talking about it then. I was afraid to bring it up with relatives. Even today, I wouldn't really ask them how, on what side of the story they fell, you know, that. So it was really through meeting some people who had been directly affected by the dictatorship that I started to find out more. And what was the nature of this silence? What was there a feeling that it was you didn't know? It was it like nowadays here, where in certain states you're a little careful not to talk about politics. And you just mm. never quite know where what people think, and you don't want to get in a fight. Or or was it a little more I mean, uh, I, deep than that? Okay, so I'm not. I'm not a psychologist or, or, or a historian, but I, one of the things that I learned about was this campaign. I was too young when it was happening. It was called Silence is, is Health, El Silencio es Salud, which was put on the obelisk in the center of town during Peron's time. Basically, wow. it was ostentatious, um, ostentatiously as a, as a way of getting the citizens to be quiet, not to honk their horns, to be, you know, not to have so much noise pollution. But it was really a message to journalists, mm. to thinkers, to artists, to not speak out about, um, you know, the government. If they didn't have anything good to say, to not say anything at all. And I don't know if that carried through the years. Um, I know from some of the stories that I heard that you didn't know if, if somebody would betray you. So people were very careful about expressing their views once the dictatorship was fully underway. So I don't know if that just carried on past the democracy, or maybe people really just didn't, just really wanted to move on. Was there, did you have a political awakening of your own while you were there? Did, did you, was there something, an encounter or a, an, a, an experience that made you engage with this more deeply? Well, I met, I met somebody at a poetry workshop who was very frank about his childhood not being a happy one. We were sharing stories about growing up in, in the city. I had come to this workshop with a, an old childhood friend, and he told me that his father had 